Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast with your host, Andrew Keel. This is the podcast where you can get the education you need to invest 100% passively in the highly profitable niche of mobile home parks. Welcome to the Passive Mobile Home Park Investing Podcast. This is your host, Andrew Keel. And today we have an amazing guest in Mr. Ryan Smith. Ryan is a founder of Elevation Capital Group. Elevation is a respected leader in the alternative real estate investment arena. The company focuses exclusively on two niche property types, manufactured housing communities and storage facilities. Elevation, through its affiliates, has acquired properties worth more than $600 million and has held an interest in over 175 assets across more than 30 states. And uh, near and dear to my heart, Ryan actually helped me get into the business some time ago. Uh, we met at a New View uh, Trust uh, event and hit it off. And it was just, Ryan was was kind enough to show me the business. And uh, I, I read his, uh, his wife's book, Trailer Cash, and even did like a little, a little event training. So I'm a big fan of Ryan. He's always been willing to share uh, his knowledge with myself and, and with others. So Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. We, we really appreciate it. Oh, it's good to see you. It's, it's fun to say I knew you when, uh, but <laughs> you've, you've, you've always been a stud. That was clear from the beginning. So no surprise, you've done incredibly well. Well, thank you. I, I really appreciate that. Um, would you mind starting out, Ryan, by telling us a little bit about your story and, and how you got into manufactured housing? Sure. So um, to make a real long story short, um, both my wife and I came from real estate. You know, our families were in real estate, but, um, you know, your listener may, may be listening to that and say, ah, see, they have a leg up. They, they had real estate background. But, um, but my, um, my family and my wife's family, it was, it was kind of blue collar, you know, real estate. It was buy, buy properties and fix them and keep them long term, hope that, you know, the tenants one day pay them off kind of thing. And, you know, and, and then continue to hope that that produced an outcome. Um, and, and it really, and it didn't, it did in, in certain ways, but in short, you know, we both came from real estate backgrounds. Um, you know, I, I had more of an analytics bent, um, for my family business, um, and whatnot. So when Jamie and I met and we started building a business, um, together in our early twenties, we started with what our families did and what we knew, which was single family residential. So we started buying, you know, single family houses. The goal is to own them long-term, our tenants pay them off. Sounds very familiar to what our families did uh, or similar. Um, and what we found is once we got to around 25 properties, um, it, it wasn't as scalable a business as we had, had hoped. And, you know, we at that point had stepped beyond the experience of our parents um, and were kind of in uncharted territories. Um, and so we had to ask ourselves, is, is this a business we really wanted to build? Is, does, it, does it actually get better? And if, if so, when? And we didn't know the answer to either of those questions. So we started looking at other product types, other ways to go and grow. And um, so our, our thought was we would, we we're, were fa fairly analytical. So we, we spent some time and we created these models, these real rough um, underwriting models of different asset classes. So storage, mobile home parks, billboards, office, retail, apartments, the gamut. And, you know, we, we basically, our thought was we would throw the models on a table and pursue the ones that were the most compelling for the purpose of producing what we were looking for, you know? And at that time, it's really similar to what we want today. We wanted cash flow, capital appreciation, tax benefits, and you know, a thousand ways to say the last one, cycle resiliency, low beta, low correlation, you know, said another way, we wanted off the roller coaster as much as possible. So, um, so believe it or not, the, the outcome of that process brought us to mobile home parks. It was at our, at that point, the two most compelling asset classes were storage and mobile home parks. Um, but mobile home parks were a lot more, or I'd say a lot more undiscovered at that point in time. Um, you know, we, you know, we started by buying, you know, properties generally at that time were, you know, two star quality rural markets you could buy in the, in the 20 plus cap rate range, um, you know. Um, so anyway, that's, that's 
that's what brought us to the asset class uh, was that that kind of that process I described. That's fantastic. And the more and more that I learn uh, about the asset class, uh, you know, and I think about, you know, wow, what if I could have got in earlier, right? When the, when the 20 caps were, you know, readily available, it's just, it's, it's quite, uh, quite a different story today, but there's still opportunity out there, I'm sure. Um, wow. Well, tell us, Ryan, what are the most important things that passive investors need to look out for when investing into the mobile home park asset class? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Um, I mean, w- when you say passive, I- I'll tell you my presumption is that somebody's looking um, at, a, at a third party to do the work, an operator, a sponsor to invest with. So, I mean, to me, there's to take it in two parts, there's what the sponsor does and whether or not that aligns with, um, you know, one's risk goals and objectives. And then there's, to me, it's the most important, but it's also the soft side, which is the who who the sponsor is. Um, you know, when all the, you know, when it, if you were to listen to every conversation they have in their office, on their phone, in the private, you know, the quiet of night, are they people who um, will act as a fiduciary for you um, and keep your interest above their own? And, uh, and you know, it, anyway, those are the two component parts, at least in my mind, to consider the most important of the two is also the hardest of the two, which is the people. You know, it's not a quick box to check. There is, there's no quick, there's no quick, uh, you can't jump to trust. You know, it's, 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 it's really tough, but, um, but anyway, that, I mean, to me, you need to look, I, I would think at the quality of the person, you know, obviously intellect is important, having a good model that you agree with. And there's a lot of discussion we can have around model and differences in the model and, and how to go about that. But um, uh, you've never met a sponsor who has a bad model, according to them. But, you know, to me, it's, um, to me, it's really about the people. Yeah. And, and that's been a recurring theme from previous interviews is that there's a lot of weight on the sponsor. And uh, that's, it's really, you know, difficult. There's been different points of view on how to vet a sponsor, you know, because uh, there's, uh, there's just, there's so much you can do. It's like interviewing people, right? There's, there's so much you can do before you hire someone to truly gauge, you know, how they're going to perform, you know, 90 days down the line. So any any tips on, uh, on vetting a sponsor or something that, you know, you would, you know, just a quick tip that someone could do. And like some people like to meet them in person, uh, you know, anything you would offer or you would, you would bring up would be. Yeah. I I would, I would say just, I guess, just to start, you know, to me, when you're vetting a sponsor, I, I would say call it what it is. What you're not trying to do is is jump to trust because you can't. You just start by saying you can't do that and you shouldn't try it because you may, if you try to do what shouldn't or can't be done, you may compromise your process. Um, so to me, it's you know what you're trying to do is get comfortable with the business model and get as comfortable with the process that the person is is not a crook, you know, as 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 possible. And then once you get to a and everybody has a different threshold of, of, of comfort, at some point you got you to either fish or cut bait. And, and what it is, quite honestly, your first investment with a new sponsor is, is a, a statement that you hope they're honest. And I wish it could be more confident than that and more clear, but really it, it really is what it is. I can almost hear the sigh of relief when people receive at least their second check from us in a row. It's like, oh, oh thank the Lord, they're doing what they said. <laughs> Um, and there's, I, I could jump up and down. I could try with every ounce of effort in me. I can't change that. I don't know how to. Um, but in terms of, to your question of a quick tip on, you know, it's all the common ones. You know, it's, it's, you know, to a degree, you know, talk to people who've invested with the sponsor for ideally, you know, I mean, we have people who've been more than a decade, which is nice. Um, but, you know, as long as, as possible, um, you know, meet with them in person. Um, you know, talk to people that are around them, try to gauge, um, you know, I, I think understanding kind of the, the, to a degree where, where a person spends their time says a lot about the person. So what, what are their hobbies? What do they do outside of work might speak to who they are as people. But, um, but again, there's, there's no, there's no fast and, you know, fast and accurate way. It's, 
a lot of it's VFR, it's fly by sight. Yeah. And I, I heard it put once, you know, uh, a bad sponsor can mess up a good deal really fast Sure. and, and a good sponsor can, can make a, a bad deal good to an extent. Right. So, yep. uh, Awesome. Would you mind uh, telling us, I mean, from, from your experience, like you said, you have investors that have invested with you for over a decade, you know, where do you think we are in the current you know, cycle? And can you tell us about the current state of the manufactured housing industry and, you know, where do you see it going into the you know, foreseeable future? Yeah. So I'll start with that. And on, on kind of the, on the business, the kind of the fundamental business of mobile home parks, I, I don't see really any substantive change. I think, you know, the the supply side, I think will continue to be constrained by a stigma, which I think will, you know, persist. I think there will probably be some accommodation over the next decade for uh, bringing out new supply more easily, removing barriers, um, you know, and, and maybe removing some of those supply side constraints, but the, the stigma will still be pretty, pretty significant. So I don't know, I don't really expect that to do really anything overly significant. Um, you know, on the demand side, I'll say both fortunately, and unfortunately, I, I think demand will continue to grow as technology continues to disintermediate, which is what it does, um, is it, it removes middlemen um, from processes and, and that's typically human labor and, and ironically, typically middle class, um, which is, you know, so I, I think um, I think technology will continue to um, you know, create demand for the product type. So I, I think demand will continue to be strong and grow. I think supply will continue to be constrained um, set against that demand. Um, in terms of kind of the, um, the investment lens of the business, um, there's a ton of new capital chasing deals. Um, there's a ton of capital period of, in all product types chasing deals. You know, we talked about it this afternoon with a group I'm in. You know, 20 years ago, there were 8,000 publicly traded companies. Today, there's 4,000 publicly traded companies. So, you know, there, there's a lot of money chasing fewer and fewer deals uh, and really all asset classes and types. But certainly it's true in the mobile home park space. I, I got into the business where I would have been thrown out of a room for saying I bought mobile home parks at the beginning. Now it's people invite me in because I do mobile home park. It's a very weird um, change, but in short, so I say all that to give some background to say there's a lot of money chasing deals. Um, you know, we've seen a significant amount of cap compression, especially on the more on the non-institutional product types, the kind of the rural, lower quality, you know, tertiary market. I've seen a lot of cap compression in that space. I mean, so I, the in short, I think there will continue to be a lot of capital. I think interest rates will probably remain low for the foreseeable future. I think the broader, um, you know, the broader economy on a on a longer term basis. I think, you know, when you look at the economy as an engine and debt as its fuel to a degree, um, you know, I, I don't see a lot of ability to add fuel to growth. So I, I think um, growth prospects will be muted. I, I believe um, corporate earnings will probably be. Uh, the growth rates will probably be pretty slow. So I say that to say, I think demand for income will continue to remain quite high. The Fed's been very, put a lot of money out in the market and it's looking for a home. So I think when you look at low interest rates, the prospect of low inflation, a lot of capital and the hunger for yield, I think it's accommodative to lower cap rates for the foreseeable future. And I say that because there's been, and you've heard it, you know, there's this really ever since 2014, I started hearing it in 2014, this presumption that cap rates were low and they're about to take a hard right turn and go right back north. And it didn't happen in 2014, 20, you know, and it's, it's you know, people, people presume that cap rates must go up. Why? Because they must. Why? Because, you know. <laughs> yeah. You know. So anyway, I think they'll, I think they'll remain low for quite some time. Um, so anyway, that's, I, I don't know if that fully answers your question. Definitely. And I think a lot of it, you know, would obviously depend on the, the financing available. And I think during COVID, we've seen some of that uh, get get more constricted at times. But uh, towards the end of the year here, we've seen it, you know, get get loosened up, which is, you know, 
talks to what could happen next year. Have you seen the same? Yeah, it, and it depends on the the source, like the agencies. You know, we just we just refinanced a, a project in our in our seventh fund about five six weeks ago. You know, we got two point five seven percent. You know, thirty year AM ten year fix with three years of IO. Um, wow. Yeah, you know, which was which was great. Um, but yes, I mean that that, that ebbs and flows and has ebbed ebbed and flowed this year. Uh, but life codes have been pretty consistent, and I'm I'm hearing about them right now, lending in the high ones. Um, wow. As as recently as this month. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I think debt capital will remain fairly. I think there there's you know depending on your source, I I think it'll there will be plenty of options. CMBS is is from what we don't do a lot of CMBS, but from what I've heard, it's it's flowing fairly well right now. That's great. Yeah. Uh, Ryan, what does the perfect mobile home park look like in your eyes? You know, it's it's a it's a good question, but one that doesn't have a, a specific answer. I mean, for us, you know, or I'll describe it maybe differently in that, in it, you know, it in that we, you know, our our goal is to create wealth for the people who we work with and for. Um, so for me, a good mobile home park is one that allows us to, with as minimal risk possible, create wealth for those who we are um, fiduciaries for over the long run. Um, you know, in any any property that um, fits our model that allows us to do that was a was a fine mobile home park. <laughs> and there's a lot of ways, and you know, I could show you five different pictures that all turned out fine, and all five look different. So that's the you know sure. that's the the hard part of the question, but a good question. Definitely. Yeah. I think, you know, other people have, have talked about, you know, direct bill utilities and, you know, over a sure. hundred lots and uh, sure. you know, but I, I like your perspective of, of looking at it as not just at a single asset, but what it could be, you know, in terms of a, a yield for investors. That's, yeah. that's great. What, uh, what would you say is the value proposition at elevation capital and what makes your funds different? Yeah, no, it's it's a good question. I mean, everybody thinks they're unique and special, um, you know, and, and a lot of moms, uh, uh, you know, a lot of our moms would agree with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I would say, you know, we kind of where we sit today in the market, there's there's a hunger for yield. Um, margins are thinner today than they were in pick a date, 2016, 2014, 2008, you know. To your point, you know, if everybody wishes they would have started five years earlier and, you know, and they, that's fine. But kind of where we are today is there's a hunt for yield um, that people are worried generally about um, the state of things, the state of, you know, um, you know, where we are socially, where we are economically. You know, I just, again, I was in a meeting today with some, you know, pretty significant, you know, business uh, individuals and the, the general thought or the general um, concern was the market, you know, uh, when's it going to fall, you know? And so the, the point in all of that is as people, you know, really start you know, taking um, investable assets from one place and putting them in other places. And, and ultimately a lot of people looking for yield, you know, a lot of people really don't want to take as much risk today as they did a couple of years ago. So kind of where we play in the market is we, to a degree are a known quantity and, um, the, the, the more uh, experienced we've become, the more mature we've gotten in our business, the less risk we take. Um, and so, you know, a lot of folks like us for our experience, our track record, the experience of our team, the, you know, the kind of conservative approach to underwriting, uh, to market selection, to management, um, but still a grassroots hands-on blue collar uh, approach to all of that. Um, you know, that's, that's kind of what they're, you know, that that's kind of the role we play. So we're not going out there saying, we're not saying that we can't get great returns. We're not saying that we can't do that, but we're not, we're not trumpeting, um, you know, the financial return profile that we can produce for an individual. We're just saying, you know, here's conservatively what we aim to achieve. Here's the team, here's what we do. And we let every, we let our track record and experience speak for ourselves. And anyway, that's, that's kind of where we sit in the market today. And we think we'll do really well for a lot of people over a long period of time. That's fantastic. And Ryan, one thing that I notice about you 
uh, is even with your, your large family, you still are able to travel to your properties, you or Jamie, uh, consistently. And that is one thing that inspires me to get out to our properties uh, because it's easy to sit behind a desk, right? Mm -hmm. and, and to get comfortable there. Uh, but to get out and walk your properties and find dollars, like, you know, find, find dollars to add to the NOI, uh, it, it, it takes work. And that's one thing that I admire about you and uh, seeing how often you visit your properties has uh, implemented a change in our business of how often we get out to ours. So yeah, it's, it's the way it's the best way to do it. I mean, you, you know, when you're at least we think so, but when, you know, when you start a new business, you, you buy a property and then you can say, you say, you know, I'm working my tail off on this one and then you buy two and you get to a point where you're like, you know, this is, you know, it's just, it's a lot, you know, you're, you're like this, you yeah. know, this may or may not be sustainable. So you kind of dream of this reality where it's, you know, you have people managing people, managing people, and you're in, you know, you're in this office, just looking at things coming in on the computer screen and it just runs itself, you know, and <laughs> lo and behold, it, it, that's probably not optimal. Um, so we, you know, knowing the true value of the dollar, you know, that that helps because I'm a curious person by nature. So um, knowing the value of the dollar, everything's a question. What if we do this? What if we do that? Um, and and that best that that question best lives in the field, which is where those dollars sit. So to me, it's it's really it's a joy. It's fun. It, it's a it's a great um, thirst quencher for curiosity. Um, and and so anyway, yeah, it's it's I. I I, I think I, I think the top needs to be connected uh, to the field. Otherwise, what's the what are they managing? They're, they're managing a business they don't understand. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. And like you said, the value of a dollar. You know, when you do the the math and capitalize that dollar of what it's going to, you know, make that asset value worth. Uh, it it makes going and it makes the trip a whole lot better when you're able to quantify, you know, the the value. So. Yep. That's that's fantastic. Uh, Ryan, would you mind telling us a little bit about the self-storage asset class and why you chose to group that and, and you know, feel that it complemented the mobile home park asset class uh, in your, your recent funds? Yeah, no, so very there's similarities to mobile home parks. There's differences. So if, if you were to go to, uh, let's say, NARI, for example, um, what you would find, there's a lot of data on NARI. Um, but one of the one of the data sets tracks net operating income growth over the last, you know, call it trailing 20 years. So the two best performing asset classes over the last 20 years for, for NOI growth. And if you're listening to this and you're saying, I don't know what NOI growth is, you know, mobile home parks trade for a multiple of their income. So if if the let's just say, so I'll, I'll keep it simple to say. If the multiple remains constant and our income doubles, the value has doubled per the income. So the and when I say income, it's net operating income NOI. So the the, the whole goal of you know buying an asset with good NOI growth, obviously, you know we we think we manage them well and have a plan for um, kind of what's called forced appreciation. You know, some to some degree, quickly improving the NOI. But ultimately, you want to, you know, generally want to be in a business where the wind's at your back and NOI is already growing. And then maybe you have a plan to make it go more or faster. Um, so with that in mind, when you look over the last 20 years, both mobile home parks and self-storage have had an average annual NOI growth rate of 4.3%. Both, interestingly, both are the same. Okay. Um, so what you'll see over the last 20 years is there's been this tug of war match between mobile home parks and storage where in some cases it's storage by hair, mobile home parks by hair. Um, and, and so there's, they, they both have done very well. There's a, the distant third is apartments, is a very distant third, it's not anywhere close. Um, and so, but, but the way they've grown, even though they're the same 4.3%, the way they've grown is different. Mobile home parks, what you'll find is a little bit more boring in an exciting way. It's more, uh, a little bit more predictable that, the rise over run uh, of the growth over time is, is, um, is fairly linear and straight. Storage, on the other hand, is a little more elastic. So I'll say storage is elastic, mobile home parks may be a little bit more inelastic in that way. 
But the benefit of elasticity is when it runs, when NOI runs, it runs. And with mobile home parks, you really don't have that ability to let it run unencumbered because at that point you're you're growing people's you know rental rates by 10% a year, 15 or 20. Really can't do that, or you yeah. know, there's the should or shouldn't debate. But but the point is mobile home parks historically have been more steady eddy and storage has been more elastic. So I guess to summarize it all up and, and to say this, if you were to pick an asset class most likely between 2008 and 10, you'd probably pick mobile home parks if you could pick anything to invest in in that time. But from 2010 to really, you know, call it 2018, 19, you would have picked storage for the better part of the last decade. Um, and it's and it'll we think it'll continue to flip and flop, but uh, we think both will continue to compete with <laughs> with each other. Um, and we like those two asset classes for that reason. So if you took them away, I'd look at apartments. Um, but nobody's done that yet. That's great. Thank you for breaking that down. And I, I agree, as our nation turns to be more of a renter's nation, uh, I think that you know, self-storage is just a, a tremendous asset class. Yep. So the other interesting thing, actually, I'll, I'll mention this really quickly because I'm I just was trying to go through the NOI picture of it. But interestingly enough, baby boomers in, in our country, about 10 percent of Americans use storage. OK, so one in one in 10 people, you know, is is a, is a customer of storage for millennials. It's actually over 30 <laughs> percent. And, and so when you look at, you know, 20 years ago, the average square foot per person in a market was three feet per person. They said it'd never go to four, then it went to four, five, six, seven. Now it's almost nine feet per person. Um, wow. And there's some projections that say by 2030, it'll be over 12. So you have wow. growing demand per person of storage. You have user bases or user groups that they, they themselves demand, demand storage more. Um, anyway, we think storage is gonna be a, a, a good asset class for the long run. And the, the biggest thing that I've heard, Ryan, and I'm sure you, you've heard this as well, is that you know, it's tougher to get a mobile home park developed you know, right across the street from a mobile home park. And yep. with self-storage, obviously with the growth that's happening and the more square foot per, uh, you know, per person, uh, you know, they can de- develop, they're easier to get developed. You know, what would be your, your feedback to that? So broadly speaking, true specifically not all the so uh, you know it's like anything there's and i, I wouldn't say you're, you're perpetual but i hear it there's there's facts that are partially true but also not wholly true and that's that's one so for example uh, i'll give you a couple of examples we buy um, we own two properties in fund seven in denver metro one's in parker one's in aurora and both locations have moratoriums on the construction or against the construction of new storage so they're trying to provide, wow. they're, they're trying to um, um, keep their land for the purpose of providing housing. So mm-hmm. there's natural barriers to entry. That's why we liked those two markets because we um, we we uh, knew that that would be going into place. So we have we're in a good spot, two good assets with um, constraint against direct competition. Um, but you know, kind of closer to you and I, you know, Winter Park, Florida, which is here in Orlando. It's a, that is a market we would love to own storage in because it's really well developed. It's very dense. It's very expensive. So to go in and compete in Winter Park is, is very difficult. And then when you look at Winter Park and you say, okay, well, Winter Park in the next decade will probably have 50,000 new people in the, you know, in the, in the, maybe in the city. So at that point in time, if you have 50,000 more people and the average square foot per person is 12 feet per person, you need 600,000 feet of storage in Winter Park, but you can't buy it or build it because it's so expensive and there's no yeah, land. There's no land. So it's, it's victory, but you know, the victor is the person who's been in Winter Park and has that location. So what we're not wanting to do, and it's kind of an obvious fact, but we don't want to build where it's easy to build. To the point yeah. of your question, we actually want to go where it's hard to build, which answers the number one question of diligence we do on every asset, which is, is the asset moated? Does it have barriers to direct competition? And if not, we're, you know, we're not interested. Awesome. That's fantastic. Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, if listeners would like to get a hold of you, what is the best way for them to do so? You know, I, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. And, you know, uh, we'll see if that's the case. If, if you struggle with your sleep, reach out anytime. 
I'll give you more facts that'll that'll cure what ails you. Um, but no, uh, our our website's elevationcapitalgroup.com. Uh, my my email's Ryan at elevationcg.com. And then our my direct line is 407-602-7662. Call anytime. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. You're one of my idols in the space. And I'm just so thankful that you came on the show. Uh, thanks again, Ryan. Oh, glad to know you, man. You, you, uh, you're you an encouragement to everybody. We're, we're proud of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's it for today, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. We'll talk to you next time. Hey, are you getting value out of this show? If so, would you mind please going over to iTunes and leaving the show a quick five-star review? I have a goal of hitting over 100 five-star reviews by the end of 2021. And it would mean the absolute world to me if you could help contribute to that. Thanks ahead of time for making my day with your five-star review of the show.